Coming up now on Michael Coronel, a very controversial book, The Holocaust Industry, a controversial man, Norman, Norman Finkelstein. Join me over there, please. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Michael Curran Live. Now, I promoted this last night as being a very controversial show, and I don't think that is uh, redundant language, or I don't think I'm being hysterical either. Everything that's meant to be controversial today, generally it isn't, uh, but there are certain issues and certain subjects uh, where debate can be difficult. This book is The Holocaust Industry, and Norman Finkelstein is the author. Uh, he's written other books too, I suppose this is the, the, the central thesis, and it has got him into all sorts of trouble, and also won him many, many fans and supporters. Some of them he probably actually wouldn't want to have, but we'll get to that a bit later. The lines will be very busy indeed. Every time we touch issues that concern the Middle East or Jewish people, I say this, and generally it's a fall on hope, but if you really are uh, a racist, a bigot, and a hater, it ain't the station for you. Go somewhere else. I will give you very little time, if any. Intelligent, open, free debate and discussion is what we're looking for. Uh, hatred just won't tolerate it. Okay. The toll-free number, remember, uh, we have that now, one 866 The other number is 416 and 905-332-3131. Welcome to you, sir. Thank you for having me. Controversial, I, I can't not use the word. It's been overused and it's hackneyed, uh, but you are extremely controversial. Why is that? Well, I think I say things in the book which many people have said in private mm -hmm. uh, within and outside the Jewish community but which hasn't been publicly said. And I was the first person, I think, to uh, publicly say what many people were privately saying. Uh, that, I think, is the main source of the controversy uh, because I don't actually think my findings are particularly controversial. Uh, what I have to say is not uh, really shocking. Uh, what's shocking is that it's being said in public. What is it? What's the central thesis of your book? Well, basically, the central thesis of the book is that American Jewish organizations have exploited the Nazi Holocaust for political and financial gain. Mm -hmm. Go on. Uh, basically, the Holocaust was first used by American Jewish organizations as an ideological weapon to deflect criticism of Israel. And in more recent years, it's basically turned into an extortion racket, a shakedown where the uh, colossal suffering of the Jewish people is being exploited by Jewish organizations to extract mostly on false pretenses what's called Holocaust compensation monies from European governments. And once the monies are extracted, uh, extorted is the actual accurate word, once the monies are extorted from these governments, in fact, the actual survivors never see any of the monies so as I point out in the last chapter of my book, it's a double shakedown. It's a shakedown of the European governments uh, on whom demands are made for which there's no evidence to support those demands. And once the monies are be extracted, extorted, uh, then the actual survivors are being shaken down. So you're saying there's been an exploitation of the Holocaust? Yes, there was been, there's been a consistent political exploitation of the Holocaust to uh, deflect criticisms of legitimate criticism of Israel's crimes against the Palestinians. Uh, and now there's exploitation which has reduced the colossal suffering of the Jewish people during World War II, has reduced that suffering to the moral stature of a Monte Carlo casino. And that's deeply offensive hmm. besides being immoral. I respect strong, firm history. Um, using a term like uh, Monte Carlo Casino, mm -hmm. is, is that the language of a serious historian? Well, the question... Or someone uh, if or, a, who is perhaps trying to exploit the Holocaust? Well, the question is whether the language is an apt description of what's going on. If it's an apt description, the language is appropriate. If it's an inapt description, the language is inappropriate. Uh, I think, uh, let's take, uh, let's leave me aside for the moment. Let's take the world's greatest authority in the Nazi Holocaust. Nobody will dispute that the greatest living authority by a wide margin is Raoul Hilberg, the author of the classical study, The Destruction of the European Jews. 
there isn't even per any scholar who even remotely approach appro approaches him in scholarly or moral authority. Now, way before I came along, way before Norman Finkelstein came along, Raoul Hilberg was saying over and over again that the American jury, that's his term, American jury was extorting and blackmailing money from Switzerland. Now, I ask you, is using terms like extortion and blackmail, is that the language of a historian? Well, if it's not, then you're telling me or you're disqualifying Raoul Hilberg from no. consideration as a historian. What, what, what you've done, which is also, I think, and I'm not much of a historian, I mean, my, my degree on my postgraduate work mm -hmm. is in history, but certainly there's a major fundamental and profound difference between using words like extortion, which are certainly within the vocabulary, mm -hmm. and comparing something that uh, concerns the death mm -hmm. of millions of people to a fun time in a resort in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, when I say a Monte Carlo casino, I say it's reduced the suffering of the Jewish people, which I take very seriously. I know I'm sometimes accused nowadays of exploiting the suffering of my parents, but Your parents were in death camps. my parents were uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto from September 1939 to May 1943. Uh, they, my father was then taken to Auschwitz concentration camp. My mother was in Majdanek concentration camp. Uh, and they were there through the duration of the war. Uh, both, uh, on both sides of my family, every single member was exterminated. I never had an aunt, I never had an uncle, I never had a grandparent. I didn't even have a con concept of uh, relatives. Um, and uh, nobody, I think, who knows me uh, will deny that uh, I was deeply invested in my parents' well-being and in their memory. And uh, I think it is deeply offensive when uh, organizations like the World Jewish Congress, the Jewish Claims Conference, uh, when they use that suffering in order to extract monies, when they parade Holocaust survivors in front of cameras to extract monies, and then, and then, after extracting the money, extorting the money, blackmailing the money, and then to inflict a new suffering on the survivors by denying them any of the monies that they have gotten? I mean, it's very difficult, it really is very difficult to conceive of any lower mm. tactic than I, the one these organizations I've, I've have met, engaged I've in. I've met survivors. Um, mm -hmm. I've met two various types of survivors. I've met survivors who, who have uh, received money. Mm -hmm. I've also met survivors who've been offered money and said, no, I don't mm -hmm. think it would be appropriate for me to have any money from this. I'd mm -hmm. rather it went back to you to, to fight anti-Semitism and mm -hmm. for fight for causes for the Jewish people. But you're saying that no, absolutely no survivor of a death camp ever got any money no, from these no, Jewish I'm organizations. No, I'm not saying that, oh yeah, from the Jewish organizations. Let me just give you an example from my own family, and I can assure you, and I can supply uh, ample documentation, it's not at all atypical of what happened. Uh, my late father, he incurred a very serious injury to his skull in Auschwitz, and he received quite a substantial pension from Germany. Mm -hmm. Relatively speaking, you can never say, you know, what would be adequate compensation. Sure. But by the end of his life, he was receiving approximately $600 a month from Germany. Mm -hmm. And it would have come all told for the, his entire life. It would have come to about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, he never, uh, even though he loathed Germans, as did my mother, uh, never discriminated between good Germans and bad Germans, Nazis and Germans, he hated them all. Hardly, so hardly surprising. I don't no, think we can no, expect never, political correctness. I never victim. faulted him, and I never argued the point. Uh, I think it would have been audacious of me to try to even argue the point. I never bothered to. On the other hand, he never ever uttered a single word of uh, anger about the issue of the compensation. Uh, he was actually, you know, quite satisfied. Uh, after all, as I'm sure you know, very seldom do victims of war ever receive compensation and very seldom from uh, the side that inflicted uh, the wounds. On the other side, on the other side, my late mother 
for reasons which are a little bit too complicated to get into on this program. She did not receive compensation from the German government, but the German government provided what was called and still is the Jewish Claims Conference, which a, with a huge sum of money, which was supposed to be used to compensate the survivors. In fact, all my mother received was $3,000 from Germany. Mm -hmm. She never received a dime from the okay. Jewish organizations. Got to stop you there. We're back. Uh, this is the book, The Holocaust Industry, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. Norman Finkelstein is the author. He's written other books, too. Um, there is, a, I suggest, a central thesis to, to the other books, which is uh, not dissimilar to that in this, which is that no denial of the Holocaust, but uh, and the, the, the author's parents uh, were in, in death camps, but there's been an exploitation, a political and monetary exploitation since then. Ideas have consequences. We're going to talk about your ideas at a great length, but um, it must be troubling, to say the least, that, it's, that any neo-Nazi website, any Holocaust denier website, they just love you. Oh, they adore you, because here's a Jew, and they can say, look, I mean, look what he says. I mean, it surely must hurt the memory of your parents and you. Of course, an idea is an idea, and it doesn't matter if bad people exploit a bad or a good idea, but how do you deal with that, that you're constantly quoted by those who deny the Holocaust and actually would like to kill Jews if they could? Well... Let me just make a general answer, and then I'll get to the specific one of the Holocaust deniers. The general answer is that uh, my book, my little book, uh, attempts to restore the actual record uh, because I am concerned that the truth be preserved. I am concerned that the memory is not uh, falsified and then open to Holocaust denial. The real Holocaust deniers are the Holocaust industry not me and I don't mean that as a kind of rhetorical trick to play to spring on you yeah, but the that, fact that you're, you're not answering, you're not answering the yeah, question okay. we can get to that later the okay. question was how do you feel when well, and let's mm -hmm. not pretend that you know people generally say well you know I was reading the Holocaust industry mm -hmm. today you are the darling of mm -hmm. Jew haters uh, Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites I'll say mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm a relatively deep thinker it doesn't mm -hmm. mean the idea is wrong if bad mm -hmm. people exploit it but it mm -hmm. must hurt you as a son of, of a survivor as a Jew well, that you're on every Holocaust well, denier's website well, and they use you as a weapon. The politics makes for strange bedfellows and it's deeply regrettable. On the other hand, for example, uh, one of your homegrown uh, Holocaust deniers, er, uh, Mr. Zundel. German, actually. Uh, uh, right. Well, I think he resides in Canada. No, he's in the States now, I think. Oh, he's in the States. Yeah, okay. we lost him. Okay, uh, well, you he, can't win them all. When he was here, um, occasionally he would send me huge packages and uh, I noticed that the files he assembled included people like Raoul Hilberg, it included people like uh, Abraham Foxman, the head of the Anti-Defamation League, yeah. because all of them had denounced for different reasons, but they had all denounced the Holocaust compensation racket. Uh, you can't always, uh, you know, uh, determine who's going to make use of what you write. It's, it's, it's regrettable. I'm not happy about it, for sure. Uh, I'm un uncomfortable with it, for sure. But basically, in any moral decision, it would, life would be very easy. Life would be very easy if moral, uh, of moral decisions only had consequences that you want. But that's just not the way life is. You know, in my city, when the telephone workers go out and strike, mm. a uh, senior citizen may die because he or she can't contact an ambulance. That's a moral consequence of a strike. Yeah. That's, that's real. But then you have to weigh the consequences. Does that mean every civil worker has to give up the right to strike? I don't think so. And the same way... That, that, <laughs> I, I used to teach a bit of philosophy. That's a pretty strained analogy. Why? Because none of the moral, sociological, intellectual content is similar from one part of the analogy to the other. No, the thing is, in moral decisions, there are always consequences which were unintended right. or undesirable. Let's talk about morality mm -hmm. and, and, and absolutes, because you criticize someone in, in particular, and I think you're right to, mm -hmm. the historian who wrote that the Germans had a particular poncho or, or ability to hate and kill, and I, mm -hmm. I actually reject that thesis. I also um, read a piece you wrote in the New Republic, I think it was recently, that I thought was hysterical. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there are elements in what you say that are certainly worthy of consideration. Mm -hmm. But have you not lost any of the ambiguity or the ambivalence in your thesis? It seems that you had an idea and you, you gallop ahead and you gallop ahead and some of the things you say, some of the terminology, you, did you refer to World Jewish Congress and Canadian Jewish Congress mm -hmm. as, as hucksters and gangsters and thugs? Hucksters, gangsters, thugs. So I, I know some guys in the Canadian yeah. Jewish Congress and I, we may agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. I don't see them as thugs and gangsters. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe... Could you just say they were wrong? No, I don't think this was a question of wrong. They were fully cognizant of what they were doing. They were fully knowledgeable that they were blackmailing the Swiss. There was no lack of knowledge on their part of what they were doing. They were not unknowledgeably hijacking the colossal suffering of the Jewish people in a shakedown racket. Mm. That was not done sleepwalking. They knew exactly what they were doing. Are you trying to suggest to me they are not aware that when every day the handful of surviving victims of the Nazi persecution are begging them for a health care plan? Are they not aware that they're denying these victims simply a health care plan from all the money they have accumulated what I'm saying. according to their own estimate they have accumulated approximately 14 billion dollars mm. and they don't have money for a health care plan what, what, for survivors. What, what I'm saying I suppose mm -hmm. as someone who studied under and you'll be aware of these men AJP Taylor mm -hmm. I'm sure you uh, GR Elton mm -hmm. uh, Bindoff uh, mm -hmm. as an historian that with all due respect you can take on a, a very difficult issue and you can mold and shape and tear that issue mm -hmm. But none of those great men I studied under would use terms like gangster, thug, and huckster. Mm -hmm. and, and they could, goodness me, I, I, I saw them destroy people intellectually, but they didn't have to sort of use that sort of language. And excuse if this is wrong, I apologize, but it's a, a, the language of, of the dockside bully rather than mm -hmm. the intellectual and the historian. Well, you know, uh, I'm not here to defend a language. Honest people can disagree on those questions. Yes. And, you know, Professor Hilberg, uh, if you've read his The Destruction of the European mm -hmm. Jews, he doesn't have a single adjective in the book. He has no adverbs in the book. He has an extremely dry style. In my opinion, extremely effective, but it's devoid of any kind of rhetorical embellishments. No adjective anywhere no, in the book? If you read the book, you'd be very surprised. No, I have read it, but yeah, I think yeah, you'll find the right yeah. adjectives in there. Uh, not much. Not much. <laughs> I've never seen well, a book without an well, adjective. Well, my point is, my point is, he's a serious historian. Yeah, he he's able to look beyond the language mm. and judge the content. Yes. And my question is, if we're serious, why aren't we judging the content of what I've written rather than get lost in what my opinion is a diversion to avoid the very ugly facts I reveal in the book. We can disagree about style. I do have to say but though... Because, sir, sin lang language mm -hmm. and language is a tool. When one uses language, the only purpose of which is to destroy argument it has to be an issue for us to debate mm -hmm. when you say you are a thug and a gangster mm -hmm. you're not saying let's have open debate you're saying you're wrong you well, mustn't well, have an I, opinion I, it's like someone who accuses someone of racism to silence an argument you, 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 you're intelligent man you can't say I can call someone a thug well, and a gangster and encourage open debate well, you're silencing them no I don't think I've silenced them I think the shoe is rather on the other foot you're here I've, uh, well I'm here but I will assure you this is a very rare television appearance and I've You're never been on counter I've spin. There's Paul Martin that got you the boot I've, there I've, because of that. I've never been a, on the television in the United States. And I wasn't interviewed once on radio in the United States. My book wasn't even reviewed in the United States. However, let me return to your point. Okay, I've got to pray. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, Len, Judy, Erica, Donna, lots of other calls. We'll get all of you. Yeah, we'll get to all of you when we come back in a couple of moments. So, Michael Curran Live. Watch the commercials and back to us.
We're back on Michael Curran Life. We're talking about this book, The Holocaust Industry. It, um, it's a, a fairly small book, really, but um, dropped into the, the pond of uh, political and moral debate. The ripples are being felt in, in many countries. Norman Finkelstein is someone, a Jewish man, we, parents were in, in the death camp. He's not a Holocaust denier. I mean, he knows it happened. He says there's been a, a moral and political and financial exploitation of the same. Let's get to the calls. Len is on line nine. Hi, Len. Good evening, Michael. Hi. Uh, Mr. Finkelstein, um, I have read your book, uh, and in that book you seek, in my opinion, to make a distinction between uh, what you refer to as the uppercase and the lowercase Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, the uppercase Holocaust is rooted in the realm of history, and in terms of Hilberg and others, seems really to hold your attention. But for the latter, uh, in your book you consider it nothing better, and I quote, than the, the shelves upon shelves of schlock that now line libraries and bookstores. Uh, I have to admit, I'm puzzled by your position because fictionalized and semi-fictionalized accounts of the Holocaust, be it Mill 18 or The Wall or Sophie's Choice, are really no different than fictionalized accounts of the American Civil War or the Korean War or any other historical event. So that being the case, given your very clear contempt for people like Elie Wiesel, who you accuse of making the Holocaust unknowable through mystification, isn't it hypocritical of you to say, in essence, that the Holocaust is off-limits to imaginative approaches which can, in their own way, make the Holocaust more knowable? Where is the conspiracy in that? Okay. Well, I think you confuse uh, what I wrote in the book. Nowhere do I, make, uh, do I, nowhere do I say that uh, uh, fictional accounts of the Nazi Holocaust are illegitimate. Rather the contrary, I say I grew up reading Leon Uris's Mill 18. I grew up reading John Hershey's The Wall, and they had a significant impact on me. The distinction is not between uh, fictional and non-fictional accounts. The distinction is between non-fictional history, which is useful and which you can learn from, the classic studies, not only by Hilberg, but people like uh, Henry Friedlander, Saul Friedlander, and the list is quite long. And then there's the other kind of quote-unquote history, which is not history at all. It's just an ideological weapon pretending to be history. So just as you mentioned a moment ago, the book by Daniel Goldhagen called History's, uh, Germ uh, Hitler's Willing Executioners. That pretends to be history. It's replete with footnotes. It has the imprimatur of Harvard University, where Mr. Goldhagen then taught. But it wasn't history at all. It was simply an ideological weapon. Its main thesis was that all the Goyim, all the Gentiles, all the Christians, and uh, all the Christians, all the non-Jews, they want to kill the Jews. That's his basic. That's his basic thesis. That's not. We, we, that's we not have, history. We must have that's read different. Nonsense. We must have read different books here, mm -hmm. um, because I read that. I, I didn't right. get. And I disagree with him a, a, as a Christian mm -hmm. uh, of Jewish ancestry. Mm -hmm. I was deeply offended. As I mentioned to the PC Road, it was a New Republic, wasn't it? Um, yes. Almost the entire issue. Mm -hmm. And I thought it it was childish. It was hysterical. I thought it lacked historical mm -hmm. research. I disagree with the thesis of his earlier book, but he didn't say that. What he said was, if you look at. Um, modern German history, particularly looking at, at 19th century German rationalism and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Nietzsche and the idea of killing God and, and, and relative morality, that the mm -hmm. Germans were the, the obvious people who, who would have committed the Holocaust. Now, we can disagree right. with that, but to say he's not a ser serious historian, well, he is a no. fairly serious historian. No, there is no, look, I hate to be quoting Mr. Hilberg again, but his first reaction to Goldhagen's book was, quote, this is worthless. Goldhagen's book that's says an opinion. That's this, fine. Well, it's an opinion of a renowned authority. You know, if Einstein said a particular theory of physics was worthless, it carries some weight. You can't now, compare science with history. Now, Mr. One is an opinion, right, but we're one, told, one we is can't, objective we fact. Can't, we can't compare authorities in respective fields. Now, Mr. Goldhagen's thesis was that since the time of Martin Luther, for several hundred years, all the German people wanted to do was kill the Jews. They were straining at the bit to kill the Jews. Along came Hitler, he gave them the green light, and that explains the Nazi Holocaust. I'm sorry, that's not history. Oh, he's wrong. That's, that's, a car, that's a comic book. But, but, 
it was pawned as history. It was promoted as history, and it was a bestseller not only in the United did States he, but worldwide. Did he call anyone gangsters or hoodlums, or did he talk oh, about no, Monte Carlo he casinos? Didn't, he, didn't, he didn't call anyone gangsters. I just want to establish what is serious he, history. He and just, what isn't. Yeah, he just said that all the German people for the past 400 years have been gen genocidal murderers. I don't think that's a particularly yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, enlightened I, piece of I, history. I, I think he was wrong. I read. I just don't remember him saying that. I think what he. It was, I think it was a fundamental misreading of Martin Luther, mm -hmm. as many historians have done. Um, they don't. There was a different. I don't want to get into Lutherism mm -hmm. too deeply, but there was certainly a different Martin Luther. He he thought that as soon as the Reformed faith came along, the Jewish people would embrace Christianity. When they mm -hmm. didn't, he said some things were deeply regrettable. Mm -hmm. But I think what the author did was to construe too much from historical mm -hmm. examples. But but he was wrong. He was a historian with mm -hmm. whom we disagree, and I think he got way too much play and, and press. I agree, but with all due respect, sir, I mean mm -hmm. some of the language you use in here, you're mm -hmm. the serious historian, and nobody else is. No, I never said. First of all. The book is subtitled, Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. Yeah. It doesn't claim to be, and I don't claim it to be, a great piece of history. Mm -hmm. Rather the contrary, my book is not about history. I defer to the historians who are knowledgeable on the topic. My book is how political organizations, Jewish organizations, exploit the history. Now, if we're going to get back to the question of language, Allow me to remind you, I teach political philosophy. Mm. And go back and read, for example, Rousseau's second discourse on inequality. Yeah. Read Marx's Communist Manifesto. Read Tom Paine's Common Sense. Read Edmund Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution. I've read all those. Okay, look at the language there. Yeah. Look at the language there. That's an awful polemical language. You know, Marx talks about capitalism springing into the world with blood pouring from all of its body. He talks about the capitalist money bags. Mr. Rousseau just rants and raves against the modern world using very colorful language. But does that disqualify serious discussion of their ideas? I admit, my language is not the language of many historians. But if we're serious, Let's discuss the content. Okay. Were the Swiss banks subject to a blackmail you, campaign? You've, you see, what, what you've done, and I think you do that mm -hmm. in your work sometimes, is you, you, and you're trying to confuse people, I believe. Mm -hmm. You throw names around, and I do mm -hmm. know my philosophy too. Mm -hmm. You haven't spoken about the other works written by men, such as Rousseau, for example. You've actually named such his... Such as who? He, you, Rousseau. Uh -huh. You've named his polemical work. Mm -hmm. And of course, we could argue that, that some of Rousseau's influence was appalling. Mm -hmm. His anti-Semitism, his anti-Christian feeling, mm -hmm. the French Revolution, the bloodshed. You've, na you've named Marx's polemical work rather than his economic no, was, and political I philosophy. I was quoting uh, Das Kapital. You were quoting the manifesto. Yeah, right. But it's in journalism. The, in das well, I don't know. No, it's journalism, which certainly has had a huge impact in political philosophy. Sure it did. Philosophy. I'm not denying that. We have to risk the calls as soon as we come back. I know it's a busy one. We'll get to more. Uh, I don't know, two minutes, whatever. See you then. If you would like to contact the Michael Corrin Show, please write to Michael Corrin Live, 1295 North Service Road, Burlington, Ontario, L7R4X5, or send an email to info at michaelcorrin.com. If you would like to know more about CTS-TV, we invite you to visit our website at ctstv.com. Well, that's Strike of the Calls, Judy on Line 5. Hi, Judy. Hi. How are you? I'm well. Okay, uh, I haven't read your book. I will be reading it shortly. But this man here, not my book, this man here. Yeah, right. Uh, but my question is, if what you say is true, if there's any credibility in it, what would be the motivation, A, B, how deeply is this entrenched in these organizations? My feeling when I first understood that there were people going after compensation was a, a, a nature more of a tort, like to get accountability, like going after Bayer and different people like that, in terms of, um, as the world, we're looking at these people as having to be responsible for actions that were done. And I think, I, I, do you really debate that there are in vaults in Switzerland, unmarked funds, artworks, etc., etc., that were taken from victims, and shouldn't there be some sort of organization or some kind of movement to 
uh, change the possession of those articles and to make the people who took them and where they disappeared accountable, A, uh, that's one question. And the other thing is that some of these actions, aren't they bringing the whole issue more into the public limelight? And as we see is happening in Europe and even in Toronto, there's more and more actions taken against Jewish people. Um, and this kind of thing has to be stopped. I mean, okay. and people have to be, you know... All right, you know, Mr. Peter, very, very good question. Let's do the first one first, if we may. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me be absolutely clear. I am, I am in favor of compensation. I think victims should be compensated for the suffering that was inflicted on them. But that's not the issue here. The issue is whether claims were being made against the Swiss banks, which were flat out fraudulent. And secondly, whether the victims were actually getting the compensation money in the end. Like yourself, I actually didn't even follow the Swiss bank's shakedown as it was unfolding. Because like many people, decent, humane people, on the one side you see fat Swiss bankers or Nazi German industrialists. On the other side you see needy Holocaust victims. And it's not a difficult call. Of course, you're going to side with the victims against the Swiss bankers and the German industrialists, the Nazi German industrialists. Uh, so like yourself, I actually supported it when I was first giving it only a glancing attention. It was only when I began to investigate the subject, read through the congressional record, and read through other relevant documents, that it became strikingly apparent that this was simply a blackmail racket. And now you have to ask yourself the question. Some people say, Norman, you're a person on the left. Politically, in fact, you may be said to be on the extreme left. What are you doing defending Swiss bankers, German industrialists? And my answer is very simple. I don't think the Nazi Holocaust should be used in a shakedown racket. I think that memory deserves better. And the practical level, the fact is that these shakedown rackets, these blackmail schemes, are evoking anti-Semitism throughout Europe. Regrettably, the charges that are being leveled mostly in private against these Jewish organizations, the charges are true. The evidence is now overwhelming on that count. I don't want to go into the details, this is plainly not the place, but there was a $500 million audit conducted by, on the Swiss banks. It was organized by Paul Volcker, the, head of the, former, the former head of the Federal Reserve in the United States. The investigative committee consisted of Israelis, American Jews, and Swiss bankers. Well, what were its conclusions? It found that, quote, there is no evidence that the Swiss banks systematically denied Jewish Holocaust victims and their heirs access to the Swiss banks. The main charge of the World Jewish Congress was a fraud. Number two, the Volcker Committee found that, quote, there was no evidence that the Swiss banks destroyed the documents to cover their tracks. The second main charge of the World Jewish Congress was a flat-out fraud. Now, they've been doing investigation. How much money is in the banks that belong to Jewish Holocaust survivors? The World Jewish Congress and its cronies said seven to twenty billion dollars. They extracted from the Swiss $1.25 billion. Do you know how much money has been found to date? $14 million. It was all a colossal hoax. Mm. I have to say, um, and I read the book, it's not a long book. No. Uh, what is it, 20,000 words? I didn't do a word count. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's the that's yeah. length of a, of a thesis. Mm -hmm. um, 
I found there's pretty much one or two ideas in it. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 you've spoken about the Swiss Bank, and I'm not an expert in what happened there. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty small part of the overall compensation campaign. Correct. And the compensation campaign is a very small part of the entire Holocaust debate, if you like. Mm hmm so let's say that till we get back, because we've only got a few seconds. I want to do this properly. Uh, we'll get to Erica and Donna. Yeah, me, please. Yeah, not him, me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Erica, that's my bad side. You don't want that. Erica, Donna, Hagop, Richard, David, all the rest of you, and we come back in a few moments. I really will try to get all of the calls, but we have to go into these issues at, uh, at a bit of length. We'll see you in a moment. back, get to the cause in a moment. I was telling you about the book, and uh, it's not a criticism, but uh, it's not a, a long book, um, and what it says is interesting. Could you not, though, have framed the points of your argument um, without almost, I think, and forgive me if I'm wrong, seeking controversy? Could you not have said, and I would agree with you on this, that I think there's far too much garbage written about the Holocaust, mm -hmm. um, to the point where we said, I don't want to read that anymore. Uh, the wonderful books, the wonderful movies, yes, but there's too much, and I believe that is exploitation. I think people say, ah, what do we do here? Let's, let's put in the movie about the Holocaust. Wrong. Wrong. Yeah. It, it's too deep. The suffering is too deep for that. We could agree on that. We could say that certainly people have said, if you criticize Israel, some people, you're an anti-Semite. Absolutely irresponsible talk. You can say yes or no to Israel. There are anti-Semites who hate Israel, but very decent people always have criticisms. Fair enough. We could agree on that. That maybe certain aspects of compensation um, have not been what they should be. You seem that like instead of taking these positions and saying, let's talk about them, mm -hmm. you wrap them in so much else and throw this, this mm -hmm. package around, which is why people get so terribly upset. You seem to include everyone in your, con in your condemnation. Any regrets about doing that? Not at all, because as I said at the beginning, I take this matter very seriously. I lived my entire life with the suffering that my parents endured and which stayed with them till the end of their life. And I do strongly believe, at the risk of sounding self-righteous and pious, that that memory deserves something better than what's been made of it. Even Jews joke among themselves. I'm sure you're aware that the Hebrew word for uh, the Nazi Holocaust is Shoah. Mm -hmm. And the most common joke among Jews is to say there's no business like Shoah business. Not the no. most common no, joke. It is uh, a comment that could be okay. made. But again, you've done it again. You, right. You've just said but the I'm most common joke among yeah, Jews. Most I'm, Jewish I'm, people have I'm, never I'm, made such a joke. No, but everybody has heard it. And I think it's deeply regrettable that you should in any way be joking about it. I ask you a simple question. Do you think Japanese joke about Hiroshima? I really doubt it. Actually... I have heard uh, Japanese people uh, uh, because humor mm -hmm. is a form of release. It's a I catharsis. This is, this is not a form of release. I accept that. You asked me a question. I, right. I replied this, to the best of my ability. Right. But this is not a form of release. It's an acknowledgement that something has become almost contemptible. And that's yeah. something different. You know, when I read in the papers each year when the Japanese want to commemorate Hiroshima, they have little lanterns sailing down the river and then they release a flock of doves yeah. that reveals sensitivity oh please i think sir, so sir Are i'm you? from britain my mm -hmm. family i have an uncle who is mm -hmm. still waiting for compensation for being mm -hmm. tortured half to death in a japanese camp the, uh, the japanese the I'm japanese about government their own tragedy yes but the i'm not saying how they treat others but their you see, own again tragedy. Uh, with all respect bad history the mm -hmm. japanese the Hiro hiroshima was appalling the reason there were two bombs is because after the first one the japanese government in tokyo refused to surrender mm -hmm. but they have the, the japanese government not the people has used that tragedy mm -hmm. to get away with the guilt they shoulder for the terrible torture of uh, british uh, dutch chinese I'm, I'm Korean, to, American. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. I was referring to the sensitivity they display to their yeah. own tragedy. I wonder if it is. And, I wonder if it's sensitivity or, or something. And, and we could talk about compensation there, because mm -hmm. as you know, uh, that there are men who've died in poverty who just simply wanted a little bit of compensation or acknowledgement. I'm from, for compensation. You know. yeah. Yeah. Let's go some more no calls. Let's, uh, that. let's go to Erica on line six. Hello, Erica. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. I just wanted to say, I, you sort of took the words out of my mouth just a while ago when you said that uh, 
and as far as shows about the Holocaust and movies and movie of the week and documentary winning and, you know, Academy Award winners, it is getting a bit tiresome, and it's like, oh, here we go again, another uh, show about the Holocaust. And it, it, But the thing is, at the same time in the world, we've got all these other issues going on that are just treated as day-to-day news and, uh, you know, we're sort of, we forget about all the other stuff because, oh, Jesus, it's a movie of the week about the Holocaust. Well, no, and Erica, that's not what I said at all. And again, you've got to be very careful when speaking about an issue as sensitive as this. Uh, I said that the great movies and great books about the Holocaust are wonderful, but there's too much third-rate mediocrity stuff just to fill time, and I think that shames. But what you've just done is, is a very good example. You've said no one cares about the other issues because there's another movie about the Holocaust. You, you've mixed a, a color with a shape, as it were. We don't not talk about certain issues because we talk about the Holocaust instead. We don't talk about certain issues because we're not a fair and just world. We don't talk about, say, suffering in, in the developing world because we'd rather raise money for little kittens and puppies because they look cute on TV. For goodness sake, don't use the Holocaust. As a, that, that isn't the, the reason for the injustice and, and lack of media coverage of events in the world. Yes, but I do think as your caller suggests there is a problem with the amount of investment that's been made in this film scholarship and so on in the nazi holocaust versus the investment that's been made in other fields as i pointed out in Such my as? i'll give a very a sim a simple example as some of your viewers may be aware between eighteen ninety one and nineteen eleven approximately 10 to 15 million Belgian uh, Congolese in the Belgian Congo were killed in the course of Belgium's exploitation of the Congo's rubber and ivory resources. Now 10 to 15 million people is plainly not a trivial number. It's roughly the number that were killed in all of World War I. Now would you believe that in the English language there is exactly one exactly one scholarly study Being? on what the, came out a couple of years ago it was called King, uh, by Adam Hochschild uh, I can't, the name will come to me in a moment just give me a half but, second but, but no, there's one oh, study but Norman, on a Nazi holocaust Norman, the, num, the conservative Norman, figure Norman, is 10,000 you, you don't know anything about me nor mm -hmm. should you but you do know I wrote a major biography of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle mm -hmm. You're aware of that. Yeah, and I know Col Arthur Conan Doyle is one of the individuals but who called, incidentally, what happened in the, uh, not, what happened in the Belgian Congo. About he the said it was the, mo Congo. the most, read, gas the most read, ghastly crime no, in the I've history of humankind. I've read more than one book right. about no, what happened. Just no, simply wrong. No, no, no. They're in the English language, King Leopold's ghost. In the English language, I can assure you, because I've written on the topic and I've yeah. read everything on the subject, in the English language... I'll lend you the book. No, the only scholarly study was written by Adam Hochschild, King Leopold's Ghost, two years ago. There were, That's the most recent. There were, no. There were, at the time, there was a huge international campaign sure. initiated by E.D. Morrell, and one of the people who he, rec he, he recruited was uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, mm -hmm. and he wrote his first-hand journalistic accounts of what was happening in the early part of the 20th century. There is only one scholarly study in English. I mean, but the interesting thing I'm is the comparison. Them to, I'm going to send, send them back because I want them. Okay. I'm going to send these books to you. It's, the, it's simply, I, the comparison I don't know what to is say. on the Nazi Holocaust, the conservative figure is 10,000. One to 10,000. That's astonishing. Do we have to apologize? I mean, on that, and I will show you that you're wrong, I will send you the books, and, and I think it, it's a wild statement. But do we have to apologize that, that Jewish people write books about a period of suffering in their history? And I could argue with you, for example, that the pogroms, my family came to Britain from Poland during the pogroms, 1890 to 1905, are not very well covered. There, there are very few good, there's some, but not enough. But, so the Holocaust is covered. There's so much footage, so much coverage of it. I don't see the point you're making. Well, the point is, it objectively it diminishes the sufferings of others. Okay. And I think that's a problem. Right. I think 10 to 15 million Congolese people deserve more than one book in the library. I agree, a lot more, which is why they have more than one, but there should be a lot more. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we'll get to the rest of the calls uh, when we come back. Uh, Conan Doyle was a spiritualist. Maybe he'll come back here to tell us the, the real truth. See you in a couple of moments.
We're laughing, we're smiling, we're joking with one another. We can, you can disagree. And, and the book is The Holocaust Industry by Norman Finkelstein. He's speaking at, uh, this is uh, tomorrow, Thursday, June the 6th, uh, anniversary of D-Day. University of Toronto Earth Sciences Auditorium. There we go. Uh, Bancroft Avenue, anyway, that, that, it's all up there. So, and there's his website as well. Let's take another call. Let's go to Donna on line 8. Hi, Donna. Yes, good evening. Hello. Um, I congratulate you on writing the book. Um, I, I think it takes a, a lot of courage to do that. Uh, what I wanted to say is uh, I'm of Serbian descent, uh, Eastern Orthodox. My mother, uh, as thousands of other uh, Serbians, were sent to Dachau, and my father was a prisoner of war. And never did I ever hear from them that they were looking for compensation. They are both dead now. And I would not even attempt to even look for any type of compensation because that to me is blood money. Mm. What they went through can never be compensated. And even all the ones that were killed, they could never be compensated. But yeah. it's not just the Jewish Holocaust. Look at the Chinese. They want their head tax. The Japanese want re retribution. The blacks in the States. How many Holocaust survivors are there? Very little. It's this generation that is so hungry and greedy. It doesn't even sit down to even think what these people went through. All they think of how to make money of them. And mm. I think it's a disgrace. And I really i am glad that you had the courage to write such a mm. thing. And you should be uh, complimented on it. Mm. And I am going to look to see to, to, to get the book. Yeah. But I think it's a disgrace. And somewhere, someone has to stand up and say, wait a minute, stop. Okay, Donna, Donna, a couple of things. First of all, you probably know, uh, I'm sure, obviously, you're, you're quite informed about this subject uh, of the Jews, that uh, Menachem Begin and what was the Herut Party actually opposed compensation. Uh, the right in Israel for many years said, we will not take this money, it's blood money. Eventually, uh, difference of opinion and, and, and people on the right in Israeli politics changed their mind. Um, you speak about what happened to the Serbians. And, of course, the, the uh, Eustache of the fascist party in Croatia, not all Croatians by any means, uh, it was um, convert a third, uh, kill a third, and expel a third. Uh, in fact, there has been compensation, Donna. Uh, you, you're sure. And wh when you just throw in all these various groups with, forgive me if I'm wrong, forgive me, but with, I think, a certain contempt, if people of color want compensation for slavery, they should have it. They deserve it. Uh, Chinese people, Japanese people in this country who, who were deprived of so much, they deserve some compensation. And I've got a feeling you'll agree with me on that. Look, I agree with both of you. First of all, my parents, if I can speak on this, one issue, on this question personally, if they had not received compensation, they would never have even raised the issue. Mm -hmm. Because, as I said, and I'm sure you'll agree, most victims of war barely you know, are glad to have survived. Yes. They don't think about compensation. The problem was twofold. Number one, I agree completely with the caller that there are people who just try to figure out how to make a buck out of anything. And they realize they can make a buck out of this. Yeah. And that's... And they could write books right. like the Holocaust well, industry, uh, if I was being right. a cynic. You could be a cynic, but if you looked at my income tax statement, yeah. you would not think I'm making <laughs> uh, big bundles off of the book. Um, but the other thing is that... Um, once the compensation money was given, mm. then it was really contemptible that it was not then given to the survivors. That's where we have to disagree. Right. I mean, certainly, you, you will admit, mm -hmm. you say no money went to survivors? Well, you could say, let's say, of the Swiss money, probably okay. of the 1.25 billion, okay. my estimate is maybe 20 million right. will go to survivors. The Holocaust industry, Norman Finkelstein. A pleasure, sir. Good luck to you. My pleasure to you, thank and you thank much. you for the time. Okay. Uh, tomorrow night, heart health, uh, heart attacks, heart disease, how to avoid if you can. Three leading cardiologists, actually. We're very privileged to have them here. Take care, God bless, and goodbye.